Space Ace, defender of justice, truth, and the planet Earth. You have been recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Sur and the Kodan Armada. My dad was right. I don't want to play anymore. It's the video game years, and this is 1984. Alex is going for the record! The systems, the culture, the games. A shiny marble rolls through arcades. I like it when the marble dies, it just kind of screams. Sierra embarks on a big adventure. Look at Bush, you know, uh, grab sword, and touch pet. Why is this getting sexual? I don't know. And two video game films hit the screen. How cool is that? That's just, when you're a kid, that's the kind of thing you dream of happening to you. Plus an animated space adventure and Capcom earns its wings. So deliver all those newspapers and practice that sidekick. Get ready for 1984. So near the end of 1984, Atari Games put out their classic Marble Madness. Yeah, Marble Madness, the first game to ever have the player be a marble. Marble Madness, really there's nothing funner than playing with balls. M marbles, marbles. You had a marble, you had a trackball in the middle to control your marble through uh... What was it, like a half a dozen courses? Really fun, really original concept. I always love the isometric sort of uh, like MC Escher kind of artwork where it, it like a staircase goes up but goes down simultaneously. It just had this weird look. It's the only video game ever where the controller is your main character, basically. <laughs> You're a big blue ball and that's what you're controlling. It's almost like when you play iPhone games today, you know, you really felt like you were controlling what was on the screen. This is probably the most appropriate use of a trackball in a game. I mean, it's like marble shaped and the way you move around just makes sense because you're moving a marble. One idea that they didn't implement, which I thought they should have, was some sort of like a uh, trackball with force feedback. How would that work? Well, you know, to compensate for the inertia of the ball keep rolling and you're gonna have to go against it. But oh. they didn't, it worked out fine. And the cool thing about the courses though is that you can take risks. Sometimes there are shortcuts and alternate paths or if you can be a little fancier, know what you're doing, you can shave off a few precious seconds. You know, it's really fitting that they named it Marble Madness because the game drove me out of my mind. Like, I lost my marbles. As much as I liked the idea of Marble Madness, that game is viciously difficult. It's hard. I like it when the marble dies, it just kind of screams. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> These little glass balls have feelings and emotion. This slow ass broom and dustpan comes out and sweeps up your ball and wastes like five seconds off the clock. It takes a sweet ass time, it sweet does. Sweet ass time. I hate that damn thing. And I always wish for that dumb magic wand to come down and give me 10 more seconds, but you know, it never does. Marble Madness is one of the first games to use true stereo sound and it sounds sounded awesome. The music is really great in this game. Stereo sound, great soundtrack. Really underrated soundtrack uh, for the time. And experimental, and yeah, it's fun. Mark Cerny was only 18 years old when he designed and co-programmed Marble Madness. A really neat fact about Mark Cerny is that he still works in the industry today. In fact, if you didn't know, he's the lead architect on the PlayStation 4. That's right. He went from programming games to designing consoles. Talk about a big career. It led to decades of marble related games. Yeah. Thank you, Atari. This would be the first of probably about 10 or so Atari uh, mid 80s arcade games that were all original, original control schemes. Marble Man has sort of led the way there. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, not just a series of crazy British humor books by Douglas Adams, but also a crazy British humor interactive fiction game by Douglas Adams. I don't care much for the game, but it is written well and it's pretty funny. There's an object in there that says that thing that your aunt gave you that you don't know what it is or something. 
you switch through uh, a, a number of different characters. You play as a number of different characters. You can play as Zaphod Beeblebrox, you can play as Arthur Dent, you can play as Ford Prefect. It, it contained not only all the great humor that was found in the books, but it also was kind of infamous for its uh, difficulty. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was one of those games, and these were common in the 80s, where uh, if you did something wrong, the game was unwinnable. You input commands that the computer doesn't understand. You die. You suck at this game. Don't panic, I guess. There was challenges that made absolutely no sense, which kind of, you know, it, when you look at the source material, yeah, okay. You have to get the uh, babble fish. And there, you had to do it, and it, there was a very specific sequence of events, and there was, it was timed. You could only make a certain number of moves before the game would just, you would lose. It, it wouldn't kill you outright, but you just couldn't progress any further. You have to do so many crazy, crazy things. Eventually, you know, the company released t-shirts saying that you conquered the Babblefish, you know, portion of the game. And uh, there was a number of really cool feelies that were included in, uh, in the box. Like a pin that says don't panic or, you know, a little piece of paper that says, you know, this is uh, <laughs> the, the, the Arthur Dent's house destruction order, things like that. Danger sensitive sunglasses, which were just black cardboard that you put on, so they were always sensing danger. And uh, there was an empty plastic bag with a label on it that said uh, microscopic Starfleet. That's awesome. Even today, you got people going for the ultimate editions of certain games just because they have art books or this or that and the other, but this was like the golden age of including crap with video games. If you like difficult games and you're interested in text adventures, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in my opinion, is one of the best ones that you can check out. Tag Team Wrestling. So Tag Team Wrestling came out, it was published by Data East. Can you imagine the first time walking up to that cabinet and dropping your quarter in and being like, I'm gonna play a wicked sweet wrestling game. And then you go to attack the guy and a text list appears. And you pick your move from a text list. There's a movie called The Nutter. Which was some kind of headlock. I'm guessing in front of the groin. It is fun though, how you can like do the moves off the ropes and do the flying drop kicks and you can tag in your opponents. The tag team element is kind of interesting because from a first, you know, a single player tag team kind of mechanic is similar to later fighting games where you would swap out players in a, in a single... Like a Tekken tag yeah. or you know, Street Fighter Cross. Yeah. The coolest thing about it was is it did introduce cut play. Like if you, uh, if you were to put a guy in a submission and it's like oh, you the end, like you, that they can come out and like intercept it. Oh, they could. Yeah. So like they tried. I mean, it, the, the game itself is... It's an okay game. It's not horrible. It's not great by any means. But it was the first game in the history of video games to introduce tag team wrestling into arcade games and video games. Well, my idea is always to try to bring the best technology uh, at the lowest price to the masses. Mm -hmm. We are a company which we like to sell to the masses, not to the classes. <laughs> okay. Atari had huge losses, in particular, the year previous. And they're out. They're done. Warner Communications is like, no. We gotta sell this crap. When Warner sold Atari, they sold it to the Tramells, who had every intention of continuing the thing. So it really wasn't the end of anything. It was the end of a dream. It was not the end of an era. So Warner Communications unloads the you know home computing division and such to Jack Tramiel, who is the you know one of the guys behind Commodore. Tremel paid $240 million in promissory notes based on Atari's future performance. They basically loaned him the money to buy the company. Bam, there you go, you get Atari. And he, fix it up, have fun. We're gonna go over here and we're gonna create Animaniacs or something. Tremel ruled with an iron fist and got rid of as many people as he could. He thought that he could double or triple the profits at Atari. Well, stay tuned to see how that goes. When the Tremels came in, they started to take Atari to places where maybe it needed to go, but no one who was there was interested in going. So that's why it went from 2,000 employees to 200 employees in a couple of weeks. They just decimated the place. One of his Tremelisms was, business is like sex. You gotta be involved. I kinda like that guy. It was the fastest growing company in the history of the United States. 
And then it became the fastest falling company in the history of the United States. In the scope of like four years, I saw both of those sides. Video games are seen as a fad and they're done with. It's like, okay, that was cute. We're done with that. Now let's get some Teddy Ruxpins and play with those. That's what the kids want nowadays. Rah. So get ready for 1984 where we talk about board games. <laughs> kids want Cabbage Patch Kids. Rah. Cabbage Patch, yes, we'll sell those. Mm, brilliant, make millions of dollars. <laughs> Star Force is a fantastic top-down shooter um, that would kind of set the template for a lot of space shooters to come in, 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 in the following years. Star Force wasn't a big deal in the US, but it was a very big deal in Japan. It wasn't the first of its kind, but it really kind of established the genre there. Gameplay is very simple. You take control of a little ship and you have to defeat the uh, Star Brain basically at the end of each level. Uh, all the levels basically look like space stations that are currently in the middle of construction. Star Force was released in North America in arcades under the name Mega Force. Really, the, the scrolling in the backgrounds was what added something to it, and we started to see this in previous years, but the more we start adding to the background, the more invested you become in, in the shooter. I mean, my biggest memory of that is that it was one of the early releases on the NES. I mean, when Tecmo was one of the first publishers, third-party publishers, you would see like Mighty Bomb Jack and, and, Te and Star Force were, were big releases. Star Force really was kind of the seed that started these, you know, these grand space stories. It's a pretty impressive game for the time. Uh, it started on the Apple II. Uh, the graphics, I believe, were rotoscoped, uh, which was, you know, allowed for very fluid animation. When you did a kick, you actually, it wasn't like kick all of a sudden, you actually saw that fluid motion of like the kick going up. It looks like a real guy running and doing his cool kicks and punches, and you're just beating up another guy's, and, you know, it's like a bird there or something. Is there a bird? I don't know. Fluid motion for 84, of course, yeah. But like multi frames. Right, there's just like you know, yeah, um, on off kind of kicking. The game was created by Jordan Mechner while he was in school, and he went on to create a very similar looking and playing game in 1989 called Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia also had the fluid animation that was found in Karate Gun that kind of carried over. The goal of the game is to basically infiltrate a fortress and to rescue the princess. At the end, if you go to rescue her and you're still in a fighting stance, she'll kill you in one hit. If she's that powerful, why didn't she just rescue herself? It's also sort of a precursor to fighting games as well, um, much like uh, Karate Champ. She doesn't need you. She can kick your butt in one hit. 84, I guess, sees a lot of this sort of one-on-one -on -one combat. They want to explore how that can be done in a video game. And uh, Karateka really lays the groundwork. We play that game every day, and you know, I played for a full semester before I was able to beat it. But you did beat it. I did beat it, and unfortunately, I only got a C in that class. The design of the game was influenced by ukiyo-e art, uh, Akira Kurosawa, Seventh Samurai, and Disney. Well, They're... what are, what are you going to do? Have a good grade temporarily, right. or, or beat Karateka? That yeah, what looks lasts better? Forever. Yeah, you know, I mean, on my resume now, I have I beat Karateka. Yeah, absolutely. So it would go on to get very popular and to be ported to other computers besides the Apple II. Well, Karateka was born in New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale is. Just like me, yeah. I was born in New Haven, mm -hmm. and George W. Bush. Yeah, poor bastard. Pac-Land by Namco is a fantastic Pac-Man game that is not at all like normal Pac-Man. Did you cringe? Why did you cringe? I didn't cringe. I think you cringed. Previously you had Pac-Man just munching dots. Uh, with Pac-Land, the game kind of, gameplay kind of changed a bit. And you, it was more of a side-scrolling game where you actually saw Pac-Man with hands and feet. Oh, mazes and puzzles. People don't want that anymore. Let's move Pac-Man into platformer world. It, it was, yeah, it was a side-scroller. It was like Super Mario Brothers almost. This is a very simple platformer. I mean, I, I can call it fun for like a minute. And then you, you, you kind of get bleh. I mean, it reminds me of something like Mickey Mouse Capade on the NES. Certain power pellets allow you to sustain air flight when you jump. The game gets deviously hard later yeah. on. It's one of those games where it's based upon a lot of it timing and speed. So the control scheme uh, setup is you have uh, three buttons. You have one button to go left, one button to go right, 
want to jump. It was an interesting mechanic. Uh, you, you couldn't squash your enemies, but when you did get power pellets, you could run into them and into the ghosts w w that would turn blue and then they go away. There's a lot of cool little things going on here. And, and again, it's based upon, I'm not a fan of the Pac-Man cartoon, but Pac-Lan's fun. One of the interesting things about Pac-Lan is that for some reason in Japan, they gave Pac-Man a giant schnoz like Pinocchio. <laughs> not sure why, um, you know, if you look at the original box art, he didn't have a nose at all. He, was, he actually had feet, too. That's neither here nor there. In the American version, they gave him a nice little small nose, like mine. But, um, never understood why they, why they did that. The graphics were impressive. I was like, wow, this looks like Pac-Man, and the music was Pac-Man from the cartoon. And It's really bright and colorful and cartoony yes. looking. Well, it's based upon the, the Pac-Man cartoon from the year before. It was almost like early cell shading. It was trying to emulate the cartoon. <laughs> And now, it should have been a video game in 1984. Oh, hello. I'm Eric, and this is the stuff from 1984 that should have been made into a video game. But it wasn't. In movies, The NeverEnding Story. Not the 1986 text-based adventure game, but a game that would be very similar to Choplifter. Instead of riding in a helicopter, you'd ride on Falcor the Luck Dragon's back, because having a Luck Dragon with you is the only way to go on a quest. The goal of the game would be to chase bullies into dumpsters, but in order to avoid falling off, you've got to hold on with your big, good, strong hands. In music, Catch My Fall by Billy Idol. Catch people jumping out of a burning building with the always reliable trampoline. From the hit song Drive by the Cars comes a cab driving game where you chauffeur drunkards from the bar in this pre-GTA simulator. Following the industry crashing promotional games of 1983 comes another one. From the popular Wendy's Fluffy Bun commercial featuring the famous catchphrase, Where's the Beef? In this Atari 2600 game, very similar to Chase the Chuck Wagon, you'd run around the maze looking for beef while avoiding Burger King and McDonald's buns. Where's the beef indeed? Snorks, a ColecoVision game for the television series Snorks. They're not like Smurfs, they live underwater. The game itself would be a little bit like Smurf rescuing Gargamel's castle for the ColecoVision, but n totally not like Smurfs because it'd be underwater. Snorks are not like Smurfs, they live underwater. Seriously. And that's what should have been a video game in 1984, and I would like to play them. Paperboy was another Atari Games arcade game released in 1984. Holy crap, Paperboy! What a fantastic and unique concept for the time. Now the goal of the game is to actually ride your bike down this chaotic street where just all the mayhem you could think of is happening on that street. I was a Paperboy at nine years old, I know. I know all of, you know, it was like, it was like living my life in video game form. You're in a neighborhood, there's sidewalks, there's mailboxes, it's just like the real world we recognize. I remember as a kid, you know, you're driving down the street with your little bike and, you know, the Grim Reaper just comes out, oh man, are you, I'm like, you fool, take your time, Zargus, and just go read Heathcliff. That, that's the way games are. I mean, you got potholes, you got people walking your way, you got dogs chasing, you got all kinds of insanity. They're f***ed up. The dogs that chased you, the people moving glass, you know, the, um, all the different, like, inhabitants of the neighborhood gave, you know, each course a, the Grim Reaper. a, a unique feel. Yeah, the breakdancers. The, the breakdancers break are fantastic. I get so pissed off at Paperboy. What was cool about the arcade cabinet is that the controls were actually bike handles. We're talking real, a real, like, Rubber grips, a metal handlebars. I, That's fantastic. I gotta be honest, I always got a lot more joy out of throwing the newspaper through the windows or knocking people over with the newspapers. I don't, I don't remember this in the 80s, I don't know, maybe you do, but at the end of every street, there was a wicked sweet BMX course where you got to throw papers through hoops and go on jumps, and I don't remember that at the I, end of my street as a child. I don't, I don't think mine did either. I think in the town over there might have had that, but yeah. This was like a, a part of people's lives at the time. Paperboys were still a thing. And it harkens back to a time when there were paperboys on bicycles. Yes, and it was safe, yeah. sort of. I don't think it was. No, I don't think it was ever safe. People just are more afraid now. Paper boys coming. <laughs> <laughs> it started as a game. Now they are playing for keeps. Cloak and Dagger. Rated PG. Starts Friday at select theaters. Cloak and Dagger was released as a double feature alongside The Last Starfighter. The plot was a convoluted like spy thing where there's like 
secret government information or something like that that's stuck in an Atari 5200 cartridge. You know, great product placement there by Atari. The movie itself is about the kid Henry Thomas, you know, from E.T. Um, and his dad, Dabney Coleman, um, who also plays the imaginary friend in the game. So the kid's trying to cope, you know, he's lost his mom and he's playing these imaginary spy games with this guy that kind of looks like his dad. So it's kind of like, you know, he's, he's trying to make the father that he wishes he had in the persona of Jack Flack, who's like this super cool, spy guy. And there's a lot of really bad things that happened to Henry Thomas as a kid. You know, he actually ends up killing someone and he's responsible for someone else's death. And like, he has to like share a trunk on a ride with his dead friend's body. I mean, it's kind of a messed up movie. So Atari released the Cloak and Dagger arcade game just prior to the release of the movie that utilized that same game as a huge plot point in the film. Cloak and Dagger had a game in it that was originally called Agent X. When the two projects became aware of each other, they decided to collaborate. And so Agent X became the game Cloak and Dagger that you saw in the movie. Now in the film, the game is played on an Atari 5200 system, but all of the screens that we see in the movie come from the actual arcade cabinets. The actual Cloak and Dagger game was an arcade game that used the Robotron 2084 conversion kit. And it looked and played a lot like Robotron, but it had different obstacles in it. Atari planned to release the game on the Atari 5200 after the movie, but unfortunately the game never actually got released. In the movie, the game cartridge is sought after, the Cloak and Dagger game cartridge, because it has like military secrets on it and schematics for an invisible plane. You know, the movie's crazy. Circus Charlie was actually a hit arcade game released in 1984. Want to join the circus? Is your name Charlie? Circus Charlie is for you. Circus Charlie was put out by Konami. You're a clown named Charlie. According to the arcade flyer for Circus Charlie, it's the first authentic circus game. It's a side-scrolling platformer kind of game. And you do stuff like ride on a lion's back and jump through rings of fire, walk on a tightrope and jump over monkeys. It's really just timing it's all just timing based yeah. events like it's all just very much quick play you know uh based on reflexes and it's got a pretty amusing theme a weird fact about circus charlie is that it regularly shows up on famicom clones and multi carts well konami had another hit on its hand you know they did track and field and then they were in the previous year and and their circus charlie was a hit for whatever reason compared to the other Billions, you know, Pac-Man clones at the time and space shooters, it's something different. Nineteen eighty-four was the opening of Babbage's. You know, the the video game store. It's where you want to go get video games. Throughout the late eighties and early nineties, there were a lot of uh, this is before the GameStop sort of collaboration happened. There were a lot of uh, game stores that you know, sold used games, gave you, you know, pretty good value for your trade-ins. So there was actually, there wasn't a bag just near me, but there was actually an Egghead software, which had a cool symbol, it was an Egghead guy. Do you have a discount card? And so, no, thank you. You know, before the internet, those stores were a great source of uh, information because you can just browse the aisles and just get a general history of video games. Unfortunately, Egghead software kind of went down the crapper and declared bankruptcy. Uh, and some, just got conglomerated and amalgamated and it became the GameStop juggernaut it is today. And that was the value of them then. Uh, I'm not so sure about the value of them now. So what happens is I would go in there and it was cool. They had some layout computers, like you little like Apple. subscribe for a magazine? So there'd, there'd be like Apple IIe set up and you could actually see some of the, you know, games set Sir, up. if you get our discount card today, it will only cost you $4 after your initial discount. So a little game called Kung Fu Master was released by Irene in 1984. Kung Fu Master was considered to be the first of the beat-em-up genre. You have five levels, you have to go up. Now the Japanese version of the game Spartan X is actually said to be based on a Jackie Chan movie, Meals on Wheels, and also is said to contain elements of a Bruce Lee film, Game of Death. And you just punch waves of guys who want to really hug you and get to know you better and squeeze the life out of you, literally. The most common enemy, the grippers, which appropriately named, they like glomp onto you and they just hang on you like that. Like, what's up with that? What kind of attack is that? 
like hug you to death. I had a really cool gameplay mechanic while it was primarily a side-scrolling game. Um, you know, enemies came from came at you from the front and the back. The cool thing about about this game um, is that there are lots of different bosses mm -hmm. in the game, and they're all different. They're all different strat somewhat different strategies to defeat them. They just keep coming. And you have to stop, punch, kick, very satisfying, uh, you know, collision, right. and then, you know, they fall off. It's, it's cool sound effects, oh, yeah. really nice graphics. Um, off. So it's, it's another arcade game in the 80s that does a good job of, of balancing risk-reward gameplay mm -hmm. to see, you know, do you want to progress a little bit further or do you want that high score? Sure. Do you want those bragging rights? One of the biggest reasons it's so influential and that a lot of us here in the States know it is because it was later ported as a black box game, one of the originals to the NES, as just Kung Fu. Everybody was Kung Fu fighting. <laughs> Kung Fu Master was ported to a variety of systems. It was one of the last games to be ported to the Atari 2600. I love it. I love Kung Fu Master. You're a master of Kung Fu. Right? <laughs> You should buy Billy ColecoVision. Huh? Then you can play Burger Time. Besides, he ate his Brussels sprouts. And ColecoVision plays Congo Bongo, and Billy did clean his room. This wouldn't have something to do with a free Cabbage Patch Kid. Cabbage Patch? Buy a ColecoVision and a Coleco game cartridge by December 31st. We'll send you a Cabbage Patch Kid free. Wow, ColecoVision, way to go, Amy. I did it just for you. When you buy ColecoVision, you make two kids happy. Whoa, hey, Epic's coming at you with another collection of games. Olympic themed, we get Epic Summer Games. So Epic's released Summer Games in 1984, and it was a really cool game because it was one of the first Olympic, I mean, I did watch track and field before, but it was yeah. one of the first home Olympic games that, you know, was very popular. Uh, we get gymnastics, you get some swimming, uh, you get some racing. Sprints? Like, like races? running, I don't mean like cars. Okay. That's not an Olympic. That's not, event. not yet. Remember how cool track and field was in 1983? Yeah, so does this game. Basic track and field style games, you know, left and right, you know, waggle that stick. Waggle it? Waggle that waggle. stick. Waggle. Waggle it just to get the running going. At the swimming level, you'd have to like move the joystick in kind of like a, a, a certain fashion to mimic like the, the motion. And it was the variety of summer games. Right. It wasn't just track and field right. events necessarily, it was everything that could be Olympic. The game was based on the Summer Olympics and up to eight people could play, you know, pole vaulting, skeet shooting, rowing, some other games. They use the real Olympics theme song in the game. I don't know if they licensed that. I'm just, I'm, I'm not, Epics, I'm not trying to throw it out of the bus here, but I'm not sure you licensed that song. You I, I don't know. You can't throw Epics under the bus. They haven't existed in decades. <laughs> they did release uh, Summer Games 2 in 85. What was really, really cool about that is that the new events that they had in that game could carry over to the for the events in Summer Games 1 released a year later. You mm. could link the two and just do like a really long play oh, that's Olympic cool. kind of game, which was very innovative for the time. These games got ported to a number of... Everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Every um, computer system. And the thing is, is not all of them had all the events. I think there's always yeah. like one version that actually does have all the events. If you had a Commodore 64 uh, during this time, and it was released for other platforms, uh, this was like a must game. Like I don't know anybody who had a Commodore 64 did not have summer games. It was like, it was like a, a keystone game mm -hmm. for that machine. Whoa, hey, epics. <laughs> Activision released Hero for the Atari 2600. Helicopter, Emergency, Rescue, Operation. The mechanic is, is that your main character, who's named Roderick Hero, or Our Hero, Our Hero, get it? Our Hero. He has a helicopter backpack. Now why a guy going into a cave to rescue people needs a helicopter backpack is totally beyond me. But he's got it. And for whatever reason, it works really well in the gameplay. And you have to rescue the miners that are trapped inside different colored caves. Uh, they go from purple to green to whatever. There's all kinds of things in the way, like walls that you have to explode. And you also have to make sure to keep your pack fueled up. 
It's actually a really fun game and something that I used to play constantly on my Atari 2600. The controls are spot on and the and the shooting and it's high it's a high speed fast paced kind of game and it honestly if you go back and you play Atari 2600 games this one looks pretty good. It just looks like you might have fun playing this now. And now the gaming innovation of 1984. Ah, welcome to the gaming innovation of 1984. What new technology graced the world and changed the face of gaming forever? The Halcyon was the first home video game system to use an optical media drive. Released by RDI Video Systems, it retailed for about $2,500, but came with its own computer and laser disc player. Unfortunately, the console only had two games before RDI went out of business forever. Say lovey. Though promises of an artificial intelligence and voice-activated control system never came to fruition, this was a very important first step to introduce optical media to the waiting gaming public. That does it for the gaming innovation of 1984. Be sure to join us next year, and remember, it's not just nostalgia, it's science. And now, the Forgotten Video Games of 1984. Pat here with the Forgotten Video Games of 1984. Bruce Lee by Datasoft. Play as the legendary martial artist in this computer beat em up platformer hybrid. The Three Stooges by Milestar Electronics. Take control of the famous comedy trio as you slap faces and throw cream pies in this single screen action game. Sea <laughs> Stalker by Infocom. This computer text adventure has you unraveling a mystery in an underwater research lab. And Tower of Druaga by Namco. This maze action RPG features Gilgamesh battling 60 levels of difficulty on his way to defeating the evil Druaga. Those were the forgotten video games of 1984. Just because you don't remember them doesn't mean they weren't fun. Space Ace. Remember last year, Dragon's Lair? Let's do that again, but in the future. Space Ace was the second Laserdisc game to be done by uh, Don Bluth yep. and his animation studio. So after we had Dragon's Lair the year before, Space Ace came out and I was super hyped to play this game. Oh hell yeah. But you know, it was kind of a letdown though. I just didn't like the theme of it as much. I don't know, the atmosphere it was just a little different. It, and It just wasn't as fun and I don't think it quite had the humor that Dragon's Lair did either. Same sort of issues from Dragon's Lair, you know, if you were good at Looking at blinky things and following along the screen, you, you do well. Dragon's Lair was a little monotonous. It added a new feature in that you could, at times in the game, change from older Ace to younger Ace, also known as Dexter. In Space Ace, you keep getting turned into a kid by the Infanto Ray. It's clever. Think about it, Infanto. It's like infant with an O. And I always wondered why, you know, when Dexter turned into Space Ace and became this hulking awesome dude, then he re-transformed back into Dexter. He had to be pissed off. I oh, mean, yeah. why would you want to go back to this little weakling guy and when you could be Space Ace? Dude, that's our target audience you're talking about there. I, I feel like Space Ace's difficulty increased considerably over Dragon's Lair. Um, I can, and, and obviously it's just memorization, but I can work my way through most of Dragon's Lair, no problem. Even if I know what I'm doing in Space Ace, I feel like the timing windows are much shorter. Sure. To be quite honest, the thing I want to talk about is the weirdest name ever in a video game. Borf. The evil villain is Borf. Commander Borf? It sounds like someone from New Jersey saying, oh, I got a Borf, I got a Borf. That's a bad impression, I'm sorry, Pat. You know, you go from a, a big muscle-bound guy to a little dweeby kid, basically, back and forth, which makes it entertaining, all the while trying to save hot, hot community. Laserdisc, like any other mechanical media, they end up deteriorating and they get laser rot and uh, just like tapes would break down, mm -hmm. you know, on the tape-based games. So it was a magical time in the arcades where they actually had so many mechanical moving parts going on in a machine itself to create something that looked unlike anything else there. Mm -hmm. I used to play Load Runner on my Commodore 64. That game was great. The game's actually fairly complex. Uh, the method of attacking or staying alive is very weird in Load Runner. Uh, the levels are all made up of bricks and ladders and you know uh, wires that you can cross. And you have a little gun, and you can use that gun to zap a hole either into the left 
or to the right of you. You would dig holes and then just allow pursuers to fall into and you could just walk over their heads, no big deal. What was uh, neat about Load Runner is, well, it was kind of reminiscent of, I don't know, like a, a bag man type of game where you're in a mine and you had to, you know, collect all this gold. Mm -hmm. So it's not like Pac-Man where the gold is stationary and you can always see it. The enemies can pick up the gold and move it around, and sometimes you don't know which enemies have it, and they, you won't know if they have it until you zap a hole in the ground and they fall in, which leaves the gold above their head. So as a discovery element that not many games have. Right. And that hole would either close and kill that enemy, or the enemy would pop back out. And, you know, it, it was kind of like, it had a timing element. That's horrific. If, yeah. This sucker was ported over to most of the computer systems. Commodore 64 it was on. It got, Apple II. It got very big in Japan. It got a Famicom release. So one of the cool things about Load Runner is the fact that not only did it feature 150 levels, but it was one of the first games that included its very own level editor. So you could create your own levels in this game. You could send them in and uh, they actually compiled the best levels into a disc called Championship Load Runner. That was such a popular element that many gaming magazines at the time would run contests where people would just submit their own levels that they've created and they would hand out prizes for the best. What I like about the game is that how fluid the animation is. That's what I always like. And how fluidly you can go from running around, down a ladder, to like on the rope, you know, hand walking. Like, it's all very smooth. That's what I liked about the game. In 1984, we get 1942. What? By Capcom. Capcom put it out, and it was a huge hit for Capcom. Capcom is arrived. Right. This is their one of their first forays in the, the arcade scene where they actually had a hit and became recognized. Yeah. It's the first entry in a long-running Capcom series, and it's a top-down shooter where you control a little warplane, and you can do loop-to-loops, and you can fire, and basically all your goal, the only goal is, is to go from um, aircraft carrier to aircraft carrier and shoot down all the waves of enemies as it gets progressively more and more difficult. 1942 is based on World War II, and the point of the game was to fly to Tokyo and take out the entire Japanese air fleet. I think you're forgetting something very important. You're destroying the Japanese in that game. You're American. So what is what type of War World II guilt does Capcom have as they're designing a game where they're dis getting destroyed? Best soundtrack ever in a game. Beep, 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 beep. Can you believe it? We're about to talk about NES games. The arcade games first. Yeah. <laughs> but they're the games that were on the NES. The Versus Systems arcades by Nintendo uh, introduced in 1984, a year before the NES was introduced in the North American market. It was Nintendo's way of bringing Nintendo games to the market before they had an opportunity to play at home. They had about 30 games released, including a lot of the original black box games. The Nintendo Versus system was more or less upconverted games from the home console into the arcade. Hey, we've got these games over here. Maybe, maybe you'll play, maybe you'll like these games. Maybe a year from now, you'll see these games on something else we have planned. Like a drug uh, pusher at an elementary school. Kind of, but, but you still paid for the first hit in quarters. There were some things that were a little bit different. For example, Super Mario Brothers in the arcade was a lot harder than it was at home. Also, Duck Hunt versus, you could shoot the dog. You could finally shoot the dog in the bonus round. Best day in video game history. Not all versus, but a number of the versus cabinet cabinets were versus, like yeah. in the sense, you versus a buddy. They had a whole bunch of different setups. You had ones that were like two connected cabinets together to play two player games with your own screen. I like seeing the red units sit down like. Oh, the red tents. The red, yeah. yeah. They're so cool. Yeah. By the time the NES hit the year later, and when I actually purchased the NES and brought it home, it felt like literally bringing the arcade experience home to me, which is sweet. This was part of those building blocks into making the NES the juggernaut it was. Nintendo, you're kind of just putting, you're putting your toe in the water, testing it out, testing out the market but to you're, see, you're but, trying to see if people want these games, maybe in the future for something coming out. Toe in the water. Oh my God, Elite is incredible. 
It was one of the first home computer games that used 3D wireframe graphics with line removal, so it didn't look like you could see through the whole thing. It is really the first open world game. It is a space game where you are, you can be a bounty hunter, you can do like escort missions, but mainly you, you're trading. It's a space trading game. It's kind of an open-ended space game where you are buying items and selling them at a higher price. You're going from planet to planet, you're flying around with cargo, and you're trying to make money to upgrade your ship, ship upgrades, upgrade your parts, your, you know, your lasers, your hyperdrive, things like that. It's pretty technologically advanced on how they generated levels mm -hmm. with these wireframes uh, on an 8-bit computer system. There was, uh, the way it was programmed was procedurally it would like randomly create uh, like planets in eight different galaxies. Each game had eight galaxies and each galaxy had something like, it was like 256 planets in each galaxy. The worlds were procedurally generated using a fixed algorithm. So they had to go through and make sure for one thing that there were no profane words for their planets. So after looking through, they had to remove a galaxy because one of the planets was named Arse. And so it would randomly uh, like create the planets and like the conditions for the planet, like how much uh, different cargo was worth coming and going from these planets. Inspirations uh, that the game designer had came from 2001, Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica. Even though you're kind of doing the same thing over and over again, it just feels like there's so much more to yeah. it than there actually is. Finding space stations, docking with them, getting all the upgrades, uh, getting into the dogfights, uh, going in warp speed and getting intercepted by the enemy. It really showed how powerful British game making could be. Mm. So as everything was falling apart in the United States, things were, st were still really big in Britain and in Japan. It was what spawned an entire genre. Sadly, you don't see much anymore, but you know, it spawned games like... Uh, Freelancer, Privateer, uh, Lightspeed, even stuff like EVE Online. Have, have, they have to thank Elite for that. So Karate Champ is the video game that allowed Dukes and Jackson to first meet each other in the fantastic movie Bloodsport. Karate Champ was released by Data East and it really couldn't have come out at a better time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Karate in America was kind of on a rise. Karate Kid came out the same year. So, you know, it almost like was like a, a natural thing to make karate games at this time. Yeah, or at least port them over here because yeah. people were all about karate. And it has an incredibly unique control scheme. It uses two joysticks, and depending on how you position those joysticks, you will pull off an array of different moves. I believe it's 20 plus. There's 20 plus moves in Karate Champ. I'll be damned if I can do more than four of them. What do you, what is this even, I don't get it. You choking somebody? That would make sense if you're choking them. You know, you'd have to put a combination of joystick moves, you know, up on one joystick, down on one joystick, and that would always do like a backflip. Uh, forward, forward would do something like, I don't know, like a, a, some kind of kick or something. It was almost like, like physically emulating yeah. karate. Yeah, if you fit, could do everything with your hands. Or yeah, something. Right. <laughs> My analogy kind of dies at that point. Uh, you have like half points and points. Every time you get a point, you know, the, the round beep. Okay, stop, hold on, reset, start over. You know, it's, it's kind of one of those things. It's like fencing. I always thought the main judge was a fat female. Yeah. It, it could be. It could be a guy too, though. I really don't know. Very unhappy, <laughs> too. Why is the judge so unhappy like, no matter what's going on in that game, no matter what you're doing, the whole time he's got this massive frown, this whole face. I remember with my buddies after playing a, a big tournament of Street Fighter II at my house, we popped in Karate Champ and said like, well, let's take a break from Street Fighter II and do Karate Champ, which is a far more disappointing experience, but it was still competitive, so we okay. still got into it, and that's, it was great. Competition, one-on-one. -on -one. Aren't you a little young, Kumite? Aren't you a little old for a video game? And now, the popular pinball games of 1984. Ian here with the popular pinball of 1984. Space Shuttle by Williams. This is the table that brought pinball back to the mainstream with an easy to obtain multi-ball, an excellent theme, and fun for all ages. Spy Hunter by Bailey. This machine based on the arcade hit has such bizarre features as off-center flippers and a prominent mini bagatelle. Laser Cue by Williams. This insane mix of sci-fi, billiards, and fantasy is as much fun to play as it is to look at. And those are the popular pinball machines of 1984, because there's more to life than just video games. And now, the other arcade games of 1984. 
Hey guys, I'm Pixel Dan, and these are the other arcade games of 1984. Hyper Sports! It's the sequel to Konami's Track and Field and features seven all new Olympic events, such as skeet shooting and pole vaulting and weightlifting. You know, hyper sports. Road Fighter! It's Konami's first racing game in which you must reach the finish before time runs out, before you run out of fuel, and without hitting any cars. Bomb Jack! The game about a superhero whose mission is to defuse 24 bombs placed at the site of several popular tourist attractions, such as the Sphinx of the Pyramids and Miami Beach. Boulder Dash! You must dig through caves collecting gems and diamonds and must reach the exit before time expires. So there you go guys, there's the other arcade games of 1984. You may not remember them, but they're still fun. Where's my quarters? Tally ho! Punch out! 1984 boxing game released by Nintendo. Everybody knows what punch out is. You're a boxer. Uh, in this case, you are a wireframe boxer with no name. Green wireframe. Yes. And you would go against various opponents in a cartoon format. It was not, I don't think it's ever supposed to be like a boxing simulation. Yeah, definitely say. not. This was a really solid arcade game. Uh, it had dual screens, and you know you had the you know the title card up on the top, and you're fighting. Good, good graphics. 1984. Come on, this is awesome. What they did was kind of ingenious. Since both guys were sort of on the same plane, you would see through your character to see your opponent. Now this arcade game did introduce us to a lot of characters that would become familiar to us later on, such as Glass Joe, Bald Bull, Piston Honda. But each character had their own quirks, own ways to beat them, own styles of fighting. Uh, uh, own and levels of racial and, and, and cultural stereotypes. Punch Out is a very racial game. There's a freaking dude named Pizza Pasta in the game. <laughs> And they had a cool big blue button, like it was a special punch button that you build up your meter after punching the guy a lot, and you go like, body blow, body blow. Then you go like, knockout, like hook, hook, hook. You know, like you'd punch him and punch him. And of course, when you play this game, the buttons are so spread out there, you got the whole cabinet to play on, and it's it's like here's your controller, here's your punch buttons. And then like your super knockout button is way off to the side. It's kind of weird. It's also notable because it was the first Nintendo game with music composed by Koji Kondo. It looks really nice. So you couple it with the wireframe and you've got these two screens for the time that must have stood out yeah. incredibly well in an arcade. And I'm sure it generated tons of money just based on the look alone. It started with a game. You gonna bust the record. But it wasn't just any game. You have been recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Sur and the Kodan Armada. So Cloak and Dagger and The Last Starfighter. Both movies were released as a double feature in 1984, and both of them had video game elements, which was something really cool. The Last Starfighter was actually directed by Nick Castle. That's right. Michael Myers from Halloween directed The Last Starfighter. I remember The Last Starfighter better as a kid than I remember Star Wars. Because I didn't see Star Wars for years, but my parents had Showtime on their cable for some reason. And they used to show The Last Starfighter all the time. The phenomenon kind of started with movies like Tron, where the focus of the movie took place inside of a video game. I mean, this is a fun movie to this day. I mean, it, it is every freaking gaming nerds fantasy. You're a 30 year old teenager on some sort of like ranch somewhere and there's a video game everyone's gathered around called The Last Starfighter. And he's so good at it, it's like a space shooter game. And it turns out that this arcade game was like a testing ground to find this savior who could go and save this planet that's in the middle of this real war in space. These aliens come down and recruit him to be a starfighter. The CGI was actually pretty good. Uh, well, no, it was really good for the day. And even looking back, it's like, okay, it's a little fakey, but for the time, it was really good. And it's, you know, it's just a fun movie. Watch it, watch it if you haven't seen it. Go watch it now. It was Star Wars-like in the fact that you had sort of this, you know, unassuming young man who lived in rural circumstances. He lived in a trailer park. It's really a great movie. The orchestration, uh, the, you know, the, the main theme, which you're gonna hear about 20 times during the, the movie, 
it's fine. You don't really get sick of it because it's freaking awesome. Now, at the end of the credits of The Last Starfighter, they actually promised a real Last Starfighter video game would be coming soon. But unfortunately, it was never released. They, they, they weren't even original Last Starfighter video games. No. They, they just took other games and called them The Last Starfighter. It was a game called Uridium, a computer game. They just slapped a new title screen on, slapped a Last Starfighter ship sprite on it, put in the shitty Last Starfighter song, and that was your game. And I remember my dad said to me as a kid, he's like, you could be a Starfighter too. I literally thought for years that you could be a Starfighter. <laughs> So, Return of the Jedi was a 1984 release that was the follow-up to the original Star Wars arcade game. It went away from the vector-based graphics of the first two games and went with a more traditional sprite-based uh, video game with a number of different level types. You got the Forest of Endor speed bike racing, you've got you know, Millennium Falcon going through the uh, Death Star innards in some sort of an isometric view, and uh, also an ATST walker. It cuts away from that to another action scene of Lando in the Millennium Falcon fighting alongside two X-Wing fighters for, only for like five seconds, then it cuts back. I've never seen that before in a video game, so I was actually trying to emulate the end of the movie. There was actually a fairly decent amount of speech in the game. It was fairly muffled, but it was there. Lather, rinse, repeat, that's a game. It's three levels over and over again, but it is challenging. The first lady of video games. The first lady of gaming. Yeah. Roberta Williams, she loved fairy tales, so she decided, I'm gonna write a game kind of like that. So what are you, you're Sir Graham? You're going on adventures in, what, Daventry? And you're gonna be king, maybe, if you complete these quests. King's Quest. Uh, one of the very first, you know, adventure games, really an interactive fiction that had graphics. It was graphical based. It wasn't just text on a screen. King's Quest was the first adventure game to kind of take you away from static screens where you were just seeing them from your viewpoint and actually put you in control of a player character, an animated player character that you could move around. And you have to type different commands. It wasn't like you could just point and click different icons like you can in uh, point and click games today. You had to type in what you want to do. So you have to do open door and that wouldn't work. You have to do closed door, whatever. You know, it was just so frustrating. This was before you know, real user interfaces, but it had a decent text parser, and you could walk up to the different objects and interact with them via text. Pick them up, like, talk to them. Look at bush, you know, uh, grab sword, you know, touch pet. Why well, is this getting sexual? I don't know. But if you don't know what the commands are, you're kind of screwed, and there's a lot of trial and error going on here. Yeah, but that's what made the game so great, because I would spend hours trying to figure it out, and eventually I did. The game is actually fairly large for a game of that time uh, with a lot of different locations. It looks pretty good for an old game, but you walk so slow, it's ridiculous. It's not scanned in or drawn or bitmapped images. Every freaking screen in that game is drawn with vectors. And if you've ever done any programming, that's nuts. You are basically telling where the line to start and where to stop and you're drawing a castle and a garden. One of my favorite memories of playing King's Quest is going from screen to screen. So you go one screen to the other, and on the computer I was running on, the Apple II, I had to wait for the colors to fill in. You have to wait a couple of seconds for the color to fill in. It was uh, low on memory. It, 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 was, it was less intensive on, on the memory restrictions than, say, using actual bitmap graphics. King's Quest really started off not only a great series, but there's a lot of spin-off series, Space Quest, Police Quest, they just shoot Larry of Forest, but Sierra did. And this is the one that really started off for them. If Sierra before was this kind of, you know, smaller software company, this is a game that blew Sierra up and basically established it as the adventure gaming company for the next, like, 15 years. Correct. So, Roberta Williams, our dear, dear Roberta, thank you for bringing King's Quest into our lives. King's Quest VIII, we'll forgive you for that one, but all the rest are good. Flicky. Flicky was released by Sega. The game was developed by Yoji Ishii, a member of the Sonic team, all the way through 1999. Flicky was released for the arcades. 
the same at around the same time it was released in Japan for their SG-1000 mm -hmm. console as well, as well as the MSX. Flicky is actually quite a bit like mappy, except you're not jumping around on trampolines or opening doors or that kind of thing, but it's this scrolling, looping, platforming thing, and you're actually being chased by cats. The goal is to take your little bird and run around and get her little baby birds and take them to the door before the cats get them. The cool uh, gameplay element about Flicky is that um, you have to drop off the chicks to like the door, you know, the exit. But once you have a bunch of behind you, it becomes a lot harder to navigate past the cats because you have a whole trail of them behind you, almost like a giant tail of chicks. In fact, some of the elements from Flicky even showed up in many of the Sonic the Hedgehog video games. The, the characters are very cute, and even though the game is very simple, it's got that, I don't know, signature Sega charm. Time for dinner! Remember how drug abusers were always someone else? How pushers wouldn't dare come into your neighborhood? So Drug Wars was released on DOS in 1984. It's a DOS-based game where you assume the role of a drug dealer in New York City. DOS being a program, not a new drug. It was actually um, a game developed by a high school student for a project on business, economy. The object of the game was you needed to pay off your loan shark. Incredibly simple game. It's, it, it's a game of buy low, sell high, with a whole lot of luck. Selling drugs in an arbitrage model. You get a loan to buy certain types of drugs. You pick various parts of New York City where you go to sell those drugs. It's kind of like Lemonade Stand, but with lewds. It shows what computer, what, what differentiated computers from arcade games and later on, well, in, in console games, where everything was kind of regulated for mm -hmm. what would be appropriate. On a computer, if you know how to program, you can make whatever you want. That's obviously controversial because you Everybody play... wants little Jimmy playing as a drug lord. Yeah. I mean, it's good. Good simulation fun. It's kind of like the first subversive, you know, computer game. It's funny because by the time I was in high school, uh, you know, in the 90s, this game, I, it was originally programmed on DOS. It was just text, more or less, so in numbers. So it was easy to reprogram for... You know, everyone had it on their graphing calculators. But it's amazing the legacy that this game actually has for such a stupid game based around text and numbers and really nothing exciting. Lots of drug dealing in high schools then. Your, your graphing calculators, that's the kind of, that's the kind of scary people I hung out with. One thing though that the, the author of Drug Wars missed out on, where's the crack? Crack was heating up in the mid 80s. He missed out, he's selling lewds. Lou, that's so 70s, where's the crack? Paying off your loan shark and then pulling in a profit at the same time. Hey, it's uh, the American way. Crack is where the money's at. Hey man, you got any DOS? <laughs> <laughs> Supply and demand, baby. I need some DOS, man. <laughs> Cobra Command, released by Data East. Cobra Command, or more commonly referred to as Cobra, is the nemesis of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. There were these evil terrorists that... Huh? It was directed by Yoshihisa Kisamoto. I murdered that name. <laughs> Cobra Command was another fantastic laser disc game. Well, maybe fantastic is kind of stretching it, but basically you're flying around in a helicopter pretending to shoot other helicopters and pretending to shoot tanks and stuff like that. It, I thought it was pretty fun. Yeah, you're it's an on-rails game and you're just moving your reticle and shooting your planes, but that doesn't take away from the game looking amazing. I really like the way Cobra Command looks just because it's got like that really cool 80s Japanese anime style. The Sega CD version was pretty cool, and you can also get this game on the iOS on your iPhone or iPad or what have you. Oh, that's 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 not what we're talking about. 